Welcome to Leading Agile's Sound Notes. It is now 2017, first podcast of the new year, and one of the biggest uh, interviews from last year was we started out the year, I got to talk to Mike Kottmeyer and ask him about things that he was kind of focusing on for 2016. So it is the, the beginning of 2017. Mike has taken time out of his morning. So Mike, thank you very much for taking some time out of your day today. You're very welcome, Dave. Thanks for having me, man. And Mike's all fired up because he's been on vacation and all the thoughts have been spinning around in his head and he's going to unleash. So we're going to talk about what's going on. So Mike, what have you been thinking about over the break? Yeah. So so this is always kind of a cool time of year for us because um, it's naturally slow for a consulting company, right? People people are winding down and, and they're not buying things and they're all getting ready for next year. So so this is like always like a really fruitful time for me. Um you know, the biggest things that, that I'm really thinking about are um, you, it just all comes down to how do you lead change in large organizations? And then the really fast follow to that for me as the owner of a company is how do you build an organization that leads change in large organizations? Right. So is it is it a black art where we just say, hey, you guys have to change. Hey, this has to be different. And then people just somehow do it. Or is there some way that you can kind of script it or at least create a process for that um, folks can walk through that will lead to the kinds of changes that they want? So do you think there is an answer to this question? Because to me, it seems like I, I don't feel comfortable saying it's a black art, but I think to say this is exactly how you do it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that would be like us saying this is exactly how you do Agile. Well, so, well, that's been tried by the way. I know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, not that you can't make a time, lot of money right? doing so, it, but. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, so, so the, so one of the challenges that I, that I've got, right. Is, is we look into to next year, like I, like I read Gartner, I read blogs, I read a lot of, um, you know, stuff that the industry is producing and, and everybody is still talking about like the biggest impediment to doing agile is being culture change. And I go, well, okay, right? I, I kind of reject that, but but let's even just for the sake of argument, say, okay, so so you have all the money, you have all the time, you have all the executive support. We want to change culture, and then you go, well, well, what what does that mean? Like, what is it? What does it look like to change culture at scale in a large, complex organization? And and I think in order to even begin scripting that a little bit. You have to start to think about um, what is getting in the way of culture, because your culture is, I guess, like what is it? How would you describe culture? Right? Your your behaviors that I think are kind of driven by your collective attitudes and beliefs, right? That tends to be kind of the the working definition. And but is the, is the value so, system part of that too, though? The, the the value system that drives the behavior. Well. So, so values. So again, right. This is where this is why culture is such to me just a hard place to start because, yeah. sure, your value system is right. Okay, but what do you do to change your value system then? Well, right. That's, yeah, and that then I guess it goes back to behavior. It's got to both change at the same time, I guess. Well, well. So, like, I'll give you an example. So, well, we want you to be more adaptive and respond to change. Okay, okay, cool, right? So, I want to be more adaptive and respond to change. But you've got an an external client that focuses on, I've got a fixed deliverable for a fixed cost. I need a fixed time. Okay. So I, as an individual can be more adaptive and respond to change, but my customer and I might not be as adaptive and able to respond to change, or maybe, um, I'm doing something on top of a big legacy system that isn't super easy to change without breaking a ton of stuff. Okay. okay. So like I can change my attitude all day long, right? I can change my value systems and my beliefs all day long, but will the organization or the ecosystem that I'm operating in support that changed attitude and belief? Right. Which, you know? which I, it's, so, to me, it sounds like a parallel since it's the first of the year. Somebody wants to get in shape. They join a gym. They go work out for a couple of days. How are you going to make it stick? How are you going to make that the thing like or, I have or, to get up and say, do this? 
or I'm going to say it a little, maybe I think it's a little bit more dramatic for a lot of folks out there that are trying to adopt Agile. I want to get off the couch and I want to, um, and I want to, you know, it's funny. We keep going to this every, I think we well, had this conversation last year, yeah. but you, but you weigh 500 pounds, right? And your body doesn't work like you want it to, or, or your legs in a sling and like stuff's broken, right? I can, I can change my mindset all day long. But if, but if I'm, if I'm, if I'm not physically fit enough to even get off the couch, what does that mean? Like, what do you do? I think, I think that's a really good way of explaining it. So like your body can't do the work. I can't go run a marathon. So yeah. How do you, cause you have to change the behavior, but you also have to have something in that change that is reinforcing the value system behind it so that you want to keep doing it and not feeling like this sucks. I can't do it. Yeah. So, so like it's, so again, right. I feel like we're actually redoing the 2016 one. So maybe I'm just in a mental no, no, no. way. We're, like, we're, we're headed in a different direction. You just, yeah. Well, so like, path. so that metaphor that we were using, like when I was training for a marathon earlier this year, it's like, you know, you've got to be able to just get to where you can run a 5k. Right. And then you can start to figure out, you know, and then you got to change your diet and then you got to change, you know, how you grocery shop. And then you have to, you have to change all these different things, get to where you can run a 5k. Maybe you lose the first 50 pounds and then you can get out and start getting on your, your training regimen. Okay. And so, so again, right. So, so even if I, if I go back to kind of where we started the conversation and say, well, okay, so if once I have the mindset shift, that wants me to go to agility, then I've got to like start the hard work of becoming agile, right? The, the mindset in is just the, the starting point. Then you got to go tell people what to do, you know, and what to do is how you, how you change your program and portfolio governance. It's how you organize teams. It's how you work with and manage dependencies or break dependencies. It's how you do DevOps. It's how you do cloud. It's how you do technology deployment. It's how you do release management. Um, it's how you manage expectations with your client. It, you know, on and on and on and on, right? Just having the mindset shift, it, it's awesome, right? If you can get it, but how do you get, if you're a thousand people, how do you get a thousand people to simultaneously have the same mindset shift and then know what to go do. So, all right. I want to pause right. you there and ask you yeah. a question. So you okay. said a minute ago that we're, we're kind of starting in the same place we did with this conversation last year. And I, yeah. and I sort of agree with you, but you also just mentioned you've been reading all this stuff and it's all still talking about culture. So yeah. I'm feeling, I'm wondering if what your thoughts are about this, like maybe understanding that there's a problem is one thing, but the industry is still stuck because yeah. like I can go, I'm a CEO, I can go read a book and be like, yeah, we got to change and do that. But like you said, at scale, you can't get everybody to read the book and have the same insight and then that drive behavioral change. So how how do we get from the place where everybody's still stuck going, yeah, I want that to where they can actually do it? Yeah. So so the way that we've been kind of thinking about it for a while is is that – um, you know, a culture, a positive, agile culture, right? Whatever that particularly means to you or anybody that's listening to this, um, has to be reinforced with, um, you know, team-based structures, the right mechanisms for collaboration, the right, um, mental models and mechanisms around governance and, and, in project selection and organizational design, right? Like all those things have to support the culture that you want. The practices that, um, that the teams do and that the organization does, they have to reinforce the culture that you want. So, so generally the way we talk about it is we say, okay, let's figure out What's the what's the organization we'd like to have? What would it look like? What are its attributes? What are the the barriers to being able to have that kind of organization? Because here's the interesting thing, right? We know about 80 or 90 percent of the stuff that's going to get in the way um, before we even start. Right. So we have to have kind of a hypothesis for where do we want to go? Where are there going to be the bumps in the road to get there? And then how do we begin the progressive journey of moving from where we are today into where we want to be in the future? 
Okay. Okay. That to me is the transformation journey. So I could say, okay, cool. Um, I, we usually don't say this, but like, okay, so fine, right? Start with culture, right? Run everybody through scrum master training, get everybody super excited. Um, you know, get everybody gets their mindset shift flipped, you know, the next day. Okay. So now what do we go do? But is that, is that culture or is that just basic training in actions you should do? I mean, to me that it, it falls short of culture a little bit. You know, so again, right, this is why this thing of, of like culture is, is I think so, it's so interesting because it's like, because I, you know, it's like I ask a hundred different people about what is culture and you'll get a different answer. And most people express it as either a, a mindset shift or, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll lean more towards how you think, how you feel, your value system and everything. And then, the then others will it will basically go as to the behavior based on that value system. So it's like okay. to even talk about culture, you have to go, what do you mean by culture? What is it that we're exactly trying to change? Okay. Are we really saying that we we want um we want the organization to to demonstrate a willingness to deliver in small batches, right? The organization to deliver um, you know, to have the ability to inspect and adapt. It, we have a culture of openness and responding to change. We have a culture of transparency. So there's, there's the attitudes and the beliefs and the values, but then there's also behaviors that go along with that. Right. The demonstrate that you're kind of reflecting those values. Okay. Can you have one without yeah. the other? Can you have, can you have the behavior without the, the value system shift? So, so that's an interesting, it's an interesting hypothesis, right? So, so let's think about like what scrum is absent of the value system. Okay. Okay. Um, it's six or eight people working together, right? They've got a product owner who has a protocol for how to engage the market, how to write requirements, how to bring requirements to the team, right? They bring the requirements to the team during sprint things. They have a protocol for processing them. They deliver a chunk at the end of two weeks. Yep. Um, and, you know, hopefully they're able to put something to market, get feedback, and then adapt the backlog based on what they learn. Yeah. Okay. Do So if I took eight kids out of college and I said, this is the way you build software, and I, and I kind of prescriptively told them what to go do. Right. Would they necessarily have to have? I don't think they would. Like, like but I'm wondering what you th- – I, I don't yeah. think they would. Yeah, I don't think they would either, right? So, so again, right? Remember, the domain that that I live in most of the time is the large, complicated, tangled up companies, right? Heavy bureaucracy. Right. They start off very heavy command and control. They've got they have habits of making long term commitments to clients. They have contractual obligations. They have structures and governance and compliance all around this stuff, right? Yep. And so then you say, well, I want you guys to be more agile. Okay. I need you guys to have a, a more agile, adaptive culture. Well, so, so like, so like, what do you do with that? Like, where do you go with it? And so, you know, so to me, I think there's things you can do. I think you can form teams. I think you can recognize and break dependencies. I think you can get folks going through the mechanics of small batches, the mechanics of iterative and incremental planning. Um, so so and, can I ask you a question and, about this? Yeah. So the mechanics, yeah, sure, that please, word yeah. is, I think, really important, the mechanics. So one of the yeah. things I want to ask you about the base camps is – do you think that you can go, you know, stage to stage, maybe only to a certain point, but using those mechanics to get to the point where you are getting to base camp one, getting to base camp two and achieving the desired end state? I mean, can they, can they stop worrying about whether or not they're agile? Well, okay. So let's, let's re-anchor for everybody, right? In case you happen to be listening to this podcast and you don't know what Dave's talking about with base camp, space campus is kind of like the metaphor that we use to talk about the progressive journey. The thing that we're actually trying to figure out how to kind of script and get our head around. Um, yeah. So like when you first start and you don't really have teams formed, and you don't really have adaptive agile governance and people haven't really changed their mind and you've got legacy infrastructure and you've got a insufficient um, encapsulation, you've got insufficient um, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Like, what do you do? Like, what does it even mean to be agile? 
And it's so like what we've been articulating is a strategy for saying, okay, let's, you know, let's get enough of the mindset in place where we go, okay, there's a willingness to change, right? There's an openness to trying to do something different, but let's start laying the foundation. Let's form, um, scrum teams that stay together. Let's recognize, um, that there's these dependencies and these organizational impediments in place that aren't going to be fixed overnight. So how do we want to plan and coordinate, around that because like an ideal scrum team would have a single product owner who has, um, you know, single ringable neck for what happens in that scrum team. But you know, what happens in a complex system where you've got eight or 10 or 12 or a hundred product owners that all have a say in what that scrum team does. Right. So you have to, there's some, you have to deal with the constructs. You have to deal with the realities that are in place and then, you know, put yourself on a plan to be able to figure out how to start to break some of those dependencies and break down different parts of the organization as you go. Okay. Let's actually, if, if you're cool, like, let's, let's talk a little bit, like, let's anchor this into, like, where do I see the industry going in 2017? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if the industry is going to go here with us or not. Um, you know, on... On one hand, I see I see safe getting traction in the market. I see you know even large scale Scrum a little bit getting traction in the market. Um, I think we're going to continue to see people pushing methodology, and I think it's going to I think that's going to go right. Um, I think you're going to see go. You mean like go away or go meaning continue to increase? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Good clarification. I think it's going to continue. Okay. I think it's going to continue to go, grow, get bigger, right? We're going to, we're going to see more safe, right? And, and that's probably an okay thing, right? Um, safe is basically a scaled mechanism for dealing with large organizations that have tons of dependencies. Now you can argue whether it's the best way of doing it or not, but I mean, it's a way and it's, it's, it's probably the best articulated way, right? People want to buy a thing, right? And safe's a thing that you can go buy. Um, so I, I think we're going to see continued standardization around that. Um, I suspect that you're going to continue to see, um, a lot of failed team based bottom up implementations of scrum. Okay. okay? They're going to try to flip up and do some safe type things, but the, but the challenges, man, is what's so hard. And, and it's something that just, I think about every day. It's like, it's like, I don't think people deeply understand why this stuff works. And if you don't deeply understand why it works, then it's hard to implement it in a way for your organization that will actually be effective. Like one of the things I'm super thankful for is I got into this around, um, I guess it was 2004. It wasn't very far after the signing of the manifesto. A lot of the the early books were still out there and, you know, like uh, it's like the white extreme programming book. I think it was Kent Back and, you know, the early scrum work and the early Poppendick work. And Alistair was kind of in the heyday of his writing. And 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 what was cool about those times is that um, David Anderson, a guy, I can't I can't leave him out. The agile management book. Um, what was cool about those times is that we hadn't proceduralized it to the extent that we have now right. in terms of package methodologies, right? So it was still – everybody was still kind of exploring and trying to articulate like what made this an effective way of doing software. Okay. And, and what was cool about it is that, is that people that kind of grew up in that time um, from a methodology perspective – they, they got it right. They understand like what causes it to work. Now we may disagree on, on what that actually means, but it's, it, there's, there's, there's a deep understanding. Sure. The way the industry is going right now is that, <clears throat> is that it's all about packaged methodology, right? This is the way you do it. And the, the core challenge that we're facing going into 2017, we've been facing it for a while, but it's going to get worse in 2017 and 2018 is these large bureaucratic organizations, they, they grasp onto the promise of it, right? Gartner's basically saying that if you want to do mode two by modal, you have to do agile, right? If you want to be, you have to do it. Right. So they're like, let me go buy the package. Right. And you go buy the package, 
But if you don't understand why those practices work or what kind of environment or ecosystem that they're supposed to be executed on top of, then there's just going to be a lot of people that are running through the ceremonies of it without getting the outcome from it. Now, I want to play that. I want to put up an argument against this. So um, if, if let's say I sign up for yoga, okay, I go, go to yoga. I don't know why that's changing my body, but it is. I have somebody there who's a teacher to keep me safe and guide me through it and help me, you know, kind of grow into doing it a different way. But I never learned anything about physiology. Couldn't you make a parallel to that to like somebody coaching an organization that if that if you've got one person in there who understands how this works, can they safely guide the rest of the group through or does everybody have to get it? So here's the here's the challenge, right? Um, Part part of it is, is that we're not dealing with necessarily people and personal change that we can kind of like run on a, on a, on a set of rails. We're, we're dealing with organizations that have to be profitable. It might be like, could you get a, a diet coach and have them come in and just coach you and work with you over the next couple of years and just hope that you fundamentally change your lifestyle. But like, maybe you like, you've got a heart problem, right? You, you have to go into surgery. You, you need to drop yeah. 30 pounds. There's, there's stuff you've got to go do. Okay. Right. Thinking about it differently and wanting and changing the mindset and having encouragement. Is not yeah. Enough. So, so it, I just don't think it's enough. Right. Okay. So, so like if we could just like, you know, if we were like in this situation where we could say, Oh, okay, let's just start going through the, going through the motions of doing scrum, going through the motions of doing safe, doing things, we'll learn, we'll stub our toe, we'll do this. But I've got a product release that has to go out in three months. I've made commitments to customers that are contractually obligated with penalties on the backside of it. What what do I go do? How do I, how do I deliver that? Right. Yeah. And, and you say, and you say, well, we'll just start doing safe or just start doing scrum. Um, you know, you know, I'm sure we've talked about this at some point, but we, we worked this one organization. It was like six scrum teams, right? It should have been relatively simple. They could have done team-based scrum. There's a lot of web stuff could have done safe, right? All those things, but they've got like 46 external dependencies and can't release anything without going through all of the governance and sign off. So that's how do you change something like that? Because that is a really good example because it is deeply rooted. That's that's I need heart surgery, right? Well, you have to go you have to get the organization to recognize the fundamentals of what is needs to be changed. Okay. Right. This isn't just like so the the bad habit that we have as agilists is we say, well, just start doing our prepackaged methodology. It will start to reveal to you your impediments. And then as you encounter your impediments, then you can begin to go and start to to change them. Okay. Okay. Well the problem is is that you know that governance is a freaking problem. You know that that big batch annual planning is a problem. You know that your release management infrastructure and your procedures around regression testing are a problem, right? There's, it's like, you just know that, right? So what you also know by extension is just doing scrum isn't going to solve that problem. Right. And so it's, so you have to approach the organization and go, okay, what really is Agile, right? Agile isn't the application of Scrum or Safe. Agility is about being able to get things into market faster and to be able to get feedback from your customers. Okay. And if and if the impediments to doing that are organizational and systematic and huge, right? So you have to kind of like validate your hypothesis. If I start doing scrum and in two sprints, I go to my CIO and go, Hey, um, we just learned that, um, release management is, um, in the way of, of us putting things into market faster. You know, scrum showed us that is, is that going, I mean, he probably knows that, or she knows that, right? Somebody knows that. So, so it's like, what is, what is scrum added to the conversation? It's made you feel the pain of it, right? But, but you still have to go fix it. 
But don't you think that that I mean, just just to go with that example, that I might know that that's a problem, but having some sort of data that shows me how much of a problem it is, don't you think that that can add some weight to that conversation that might yeah, drive yeah, a behavioral maybe. change? But maybe, but think about what the rest of the organization is doing, right? What the rest of the organization is doing is is saying, sure, I can do that. Fixed time, fixed cost, fixed scope. Yep, absolutely. You know, here's the plan. This is how I'm going to get there. This is how we're going to manage risk, dependencies. It's my problem, not yours, Mr. Executive. Right. Right there. So they're committing up front to this stuff, right? And what you're basically selling is, well, I've got to go fix stuff. And they're basically just saying if you did waterfall that you would, you know, everything would just – is just maintains the status quo. So so it's like it's a really hard – it's a hard message. It's a hard sell to go in and say, look, your organization is kind of deeply flawed and it's going to require time and energy and investment to be able to, to do it. Okay. OK, it's a it's a tough sell, right? It's a tough message because you've got to go in and you've got to actually fix the stuff that's broken. Well, and I, I would think even a tougher sell when there's a lot of competing organizations that are walking and they're going, oh, yeah, no problem. Three months. We're going to have it all tuned up. It's going to be great. And not talking about the downside of the change and how hard it's. Yeah, going. right. It's, it's hard, right? So when you look at where at least I think things are going in 2017, 2018, is I think we have to be able to communicate to our executives um, what are the real costs of going to Agile. I think we have to be able to communicate to our executives, this is right or wrong, this is our desired end state, this is our hypothesis for how we're going to get there, this is how we're going to inspect and adapt our way into doing it, right? And I think we're going to have to be, um, ironically, a little bit more plan-driven, a little bit more accountable, um, and and willing to be um, held to account for actual outcomes. You know, if we have this hypothesis that culture change is going to solve the problem. How are we going to measure that the problem was indeed solved? You know, as agilists, we have a really convenient way out, right? We go in and we sell culture change. And if the culture doesn't change, well, then we get to easily say, well, the organization just wasn't ready. <laughs> call me when you're not, call me when you're ready. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, are, are we accountable as consultants for, for actually, you know, once the money's spent, um, the culture having actually changed, right? Do you get a money back guarantee if the culture doesn't flip after my training's done, right? Do you ever get people that are critical of the way you're talking about this now saying that that oh, yeah. is a very the waterfall approach to agile? It's a very oh, yeah, direct absolutely. approach. So how do you, how do you respond just, to that? So the, the problem in market is that is that – is that people don't know how to change these organizations, Dave. Okay. Right? So they go in and they want to say, we're just going to show you the light and we expect you to figure out how to get there. Yeah. The metaphor that I use all the time, it's like, it's like I wrote a post about eight or nine months ago that was like, okay, we, we, you know, we don't need to teach you how to build a ship. We need to have it. We need to teach you to love the sea or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, and so like we've taught people to love the sea, but at some point in time, you got to build a ship, right? You got to learn how to sail. You, you, I mean, you, you've got to build the team to go do it. Um, you've, you've got to do the work, right? And we've been evangelists, right? And I think that word is, is appropriate. It's like, it's like, I'm trying to teach you to love Jesus, but I don't, well, what does that mean? That means I've got to stop sleeping around. It means I've got to stop getting drunk every night. It means I've got to stop gambling. It means I've got to start helping the poor, right? I mean, it's like, it, it's like you got to do shit after, after you have the emotional response. But a lot, and a lot know? of people I think would say, well, you know what? I don't get drunk anymore and I give some money to the poor. Yeah, I still sleep around, but I got different circumstances. Isn't that what the way a lot of people approach Agile? I'm going to do some of this stuff, not the rest of it. And then they don't understand why it doesn't work because they did half of it. The, the thing that we're fundamentally trying to deal with is that, um, 
is that these organizations are broken, right? There's no amount of mindset shift. There's no amount of practices and stuff that they can actually do to be able to, 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 to untangle themselves. The, the analogy that I've used in the past is it's like, they're like a little goldfish swimming around in a fishbowl and the water's turned yellow and you're saying, okay, I need you to change your mind and go, I want, I want you to really desire to swim in clean water. And they just don't know how, <laughs> you know? Okay. The yeah. other metaphor, there's like a whole backstory behind that. So I probably just dropped in the middle of the no, backstory. That's a really, that. I think that's a really good yeah. explanation, but how do, if it is a big organization and it's fundamentally broken, they still have to keep running. They still have to keep operating. So well, how do well, they change? Well, that's it. So that's the thing that we ultimately want to talk about here, right? That's what I'm talking about in my executives guide talk. It's like, it's like, are we going to go to market with the hypothesis that if we teach culture change, people will self-organize in the presence of constraints, okay. right? And, and I don't believe that people will self-organize in the presence of constraints. So that's where that directive approach comes from. Yeah, because everybody locally optimizes. Okay. And so why, and they say, why? Well, it's hard, right? I, I have to come together. I have to argue with you. I have to, I have to get consensus. I have to, um, you know, I have to make time in my day to meet with you and I've got, to, and I just want to take care of my client. Right. Right. So everybody just shows up and they just want to do their job and they don't want to be bothered. And, you know, they just want it to be clear and they want their boundaries to be set. I mean, there's like three or four percent of us maybe in this world that really want to lead change. I think the vast majority of people just really just want to show up and be told what to do and know they're going to get a paycheck and go home and take care of their kids. Yeah. You know, so these people are not interested in disrupting their environment. That's somebody else's problem. So are so, you saying so, that everybody needs it, that it would be better if everybody was, or we want to create organizations where people are more disruptive, or do we want to create organizations where there's a structure in place that allows for innovation and creativity, but there's a balance between that and I get to do my stuff and go home? Yeah, but but the question becomes is yes, yes, the second part is what we want. But the question is, is who designs that structure? What does that structure need to look like? What are the attributes of that structure? How does that structure operate when it's, when it's effective? What are the outcomes of that structure that need, to, that need to happen? How do we know that that structure is, is ultimately going to be successful? Right. How do we measure the return on investment from implementing that structure? Yeah. You know, those are the things that we have to tackle in 2017. So I want to, I'm going to ask you sort of a meta level question for a second. So one of the things yeah. that just had this light bulb go off in my head that I realized that I think I'm closer to being on the same page with you with than I may have previously would have guessed is I think one of the things that makes me not an awesome coach is that I want people to self-organize and be self-directed, but there's a certain point where I'm like, no, just shut up and do it this way because I can't watch this anymore. And yeah, <laughs> but yeah, but that well, but that's not agile. So I'm wondering if is is that just that question's a stupid question? Is it agile or not? So so the problem is 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 it like a lot of times what I start off with is I go, well, what is agile? Right? Is agile that I'm going to sprinkle pixie dust on all of you guys and you get to do whatever you want for the next year and a half, we are so myopically focused on self-organization. I heard uh, Jeff Sutherland and Jim Copeland one time talk about the idea that emergence, right, was never intended to be beyond class boundaries in a software system. So when they were talking about emergence, they weren't talking about emergent organizational change. They were talking about emergent software within a class, Okay. Okay. When we talk about self-organization, we're not talking about letting 6,000 people and billions of dollars of investment be left to chance. What we're talking about is that in the presence of a clear backlog, these six people get to decide how the work gets done. Okay. Within a two-week sprint. Okay. Okay. And, and we've extrapolated these ideas as an industry – into everything has to emerge. Everything has to self-organize. Right. <clears throat> I'm an executive. I've got a limited amount of time to do research and learn new stuff. What, yeah. do, I, what do I chase? 
you know, the truth lies across multiple different domains here at this point. But but the notion of organizational re-architecture, it's like organizing the architecture of the organization and then coordinating the flow of value over that organization. That's the answer in this. And 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 again, the w- my problem with um, with the industry right now is that there's this huge contingent that just says, just do scrum and everything will self-organize it in, in its <laughs> well, own. It's a lot or easier of an answer safe. than the one that you're giving. Well, well, so it's, yeah, so it's hard, right? And, I, and I'm not trying to call anybody out here, right? This is just something I truly believe. It's like, you know, if, if that's what you've got to sell, right? And that's your story, it's going to work in some places, right? So if if you if you want to do Scrum by the book and you want Scrum to cause all this emergent behavior, well, okay, maybe there will be some places that works, but that's just not going to work everywhere. Yeah. And and what the problem is is that I think people are they're overselling how this can actually work. So can and, you can you and, explain what you mean by that? Explain what you mean by overselling how it can work. It's almost like, hey, you guys just start doing these processes and it's going to show you your impediments and then your success is going to influence everybody else and they're going to want to get on board and, you know, success will beget success. And yeah, yeah, maybe. Right. But how long is that going to take? And and it will it really? What if you've got people that are entrenched from a power structure perspective? How do I improve the system of delivery, understanding that they might not change their mind right away. Right. So this idea that if we just get people um, doing scrum, that somehow that's going to fix all of the delivery problems when my delivery problem is actually a 50 year old base of COBOL code that's tightly integrated and you and poorly architected and you change one thing and it breaks 50 other things. So so the challenge is, is that we have to be we have to be careful about what we promise and what we sell. Somebody came up to me after a talk um, in early December, and they said, one of the things I like about your talk is that you talk about how messy this is. Yeah. And, and I do. I think, it's, I think it's messy, and I think it takes a lot of time, um, and it's hard to make grand promises around it. So I guess what I'm just suggesting is that going to executives and saying, look, here's the mindset shift. Sure, that's going to have to happen. But here's the organizational patterns that are going to have to be changed or built or implemented. This is what we can do today. This is what we can do three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. And then this is the level of investment you're going to need to make. This is how you need to prioritize and sequence for that investment. And this is what the journey you're going to look like on. I think that's the only high integrity way of really going and selling this stuff. But Dave, what that's forcing us to do is to, in effect, build a business architecture practice. It's forcing us to build an organizational design, organizational psychology practice. It's forcing us to become lean governance experts. It's, it's, it's focusing us um, on um, financial governance and financial controls, right? It's just so far beyond Scrum at this point. Yeah, and I, I kind of want to take yeah. it one step further and say that all yeah. the things that you're describing, I mean, I can see where somebody could say, well, let's take Kanban or let's take Scrum because, you know, but any any change right now is better than what we have. So that's a start. And the next guy to worry about it. But you what it sounds to me like what you're talking about is organization shifting from being I'm a company that produces something to we're this thing that changes. And we also produce stuff, but the the entire you talked about psychology, like every other aspect of it, the organization has to go from being we're gonna lock this down and make it work this way, like a factory, to we're organically changing every single day. It's like, it's like, do you want to do agile on a team or in a product or for, or do you want to be an organization that can respond with agility? That, or, or just, yeah, yeah. take the word agile out of it. Just an organization that can c- continue to evolve quickly. Yeah. So there's, there's attributes of organizations that can respond that way. And there's attributes of organizations that can't. And whether they're doing daily stand-up meetings or writing user stories or using story points or sprint planning has very little to do with 
whether they can respond to change or not. Do you think that an organization could reach a state of agility and have all the practices in place and, and, or maybe have you seen this where they've become agile, but they can't change beyond like, that's it. Like we got here. We're good. They can't move past it. They they don't have that ability to change the organization because they're so busy being agile. So one of the things that we try to articulate, it's like you have to ask yourself, how agile do you need to be? Yeah. You know, if I'm dealing with, um, you know, with systems of records, dealing with high volume financial transactions in a relatively stable industry, um, then then I might not need to respond to change. I might need to be able to put things in the market faster. Okay. I might need to be able to generate revenue earlier, but I don't necessarily I don't necessarily need I'm not necessarily inventing in okay. every case, right? I mean, you could make the argument that maybe some of these companies do need to. Yeah. But I would suggest that a lot of them don't feel the need for that. Yeah, so it's just some it's some interesting things, man, but I think I think really as an industry and this is this is what we're betting on is that this notion of organizational refactoring and talking about not just the end state of what does it look like when it's working, but what are the transition patterns for how to get there? How do you adapt to the organization iteratively and incrementally over time? Um, you know, I, I, I think we're going to have to start having that conversation for the kinds of companies that are actually interested in doing Agile at this point. That's awesome. So I want to ask you a couple really fast questions that are totally unrelated. Yeah. What was the last three books that you finished? There's actually there's actually three books that um, that I've read over the course of the last 15 years that I'm in the process of rereading all okay. in parallel. Cool. Um, one is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People okay. um, by Stephen Covey. Um, that book is, you know, as I go through and reread it, has probably been the absolute most influential book to me personally um, to this consulting practice. When you start talking about proactivity, beginning with the end in mind, putting first things first, um, you could absolutely tie our whole transformation um, strategy to that. Okay. The idea of think when, when synergize. Um, you know, seek first to understand, then to be understood, sharpen the saw, right? All that stuff is, is so in me. Um, and then one that, that might be, um, you know, maybe a little bit controversial to talk about is a book that I read um, about 10 years ago called Christian Self Mastery, which is really about um, just building um, internal self-discipline. Okay. Um, that's something that um, I'm going through and rereading. And it, and it really talks about, you know, just like little simple things. I, this is going to way understate the book, but like, um, you know, you know, being, um, diligent in the small things so that you can be diligent in the big things like, you know, get up every morning when your alarm goes off at 6am without hitting the snooze button 10 times. Um, so that, you know, when I need to go on a, a month long business trip, I have the stamina to do it, right? Okay. Um, getting up and doing small runs so you can run a marathon, eating well on a day to day basis so when you're at a big giant party, you don't, you know, overindulge, right? Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's really just about, it's just really about developing, um, knowing your internal self and developing, um, developing an internal willpower so you can achieve the goals that you want to achieve um, okay. in the larger life. And then um, the third one is a book that um, I encountered in college, gosh, 25 years ago now almost. Um, it's uh, Structure Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, which is really talking about kind of the evolution of thinking. Um, started off in the science community, kind of popularized the word paradigm, um, the notion of a paradigm shift, what's involved in um, a paradigm shift. And, you know, and you really think that's a little bit of what we're going through in the in the agile world right now. There will be a time in the future where the the waterfall plan driven paradigm, it just won't even exist anymore. Yeah. And then agile will just be the way things are done, right? It's inevitable. It might take 30 or 40 years and a lot of people might have to die before it <laughs> happens. But I mean, you know, there's days where, you know, sometimes, you know, you get frustrated working with clients day in and day out and everything takes long and everything's hard. Um, you know, to some degree, we're influencing change for the next generation of thinkers. Yeah. No. Um, and so there's some, some solace that I think you can take in that. So I just wanted to re-anchor on, um, you know, just kind of a few of those things and some, you know, some kind of historical readings. So that's what I've been, that's what I've been reading. All right. And what, uh, record or what, uh, what album have you listened to the most in the last year? 
Well, I think I'm, I'm squarely on record being a huge collective soul fan. Yeah. And people so, are slightly aware of that. Yeah. Slightly aware of that. So <laughs> I've listened to a lot of collective soul this year, um, you know, from, you know, getting ready to do the concert over the summer at the conference, um, played shine probably a thousand times over, over that time. Um, so I've, I've listened to a lot of, um, collective soul, um, you know, I find myself, it's kind of interesting. I, I, my, my range of music goes all the way from, you know, I like some pop stuff all the way to like really dark, heavy metal, right? So I have okay. a pretty, um, pretty interesting span of control. Um, last album I actually downloaded, I haven't listened to it yet, was um, Neil Young's latest. I'm kind of interested to see what Neil Young is doing okay. um, nowadays. But, you know, if, uh, just listen to like, um, you know, Frey and um, uh, One Republic and a few things like that. Or it's kind of where my attention's been All right. a little bit. Cool. Um, yeah. All right, I got one more. Okay, shoot. What's, you've got a bunch of sales calls that are going to happen this year, a bunch of potential clients you're going to meet with. What is the yeah. one thing you wish they all knew before you got there? That, that this, is, this is difficult, right? Um, I, I, think, I think people that call us um, that our message resonates with, I think have gotten past wanting easy answers. Okay. Um, if they've tried, they've failed, they, they want to, they want to get up underneath understanding what's really going on with this. Um, but yeah, right. Convincing people that the changes that they need to make in their organization are, are pretty systematic and they require a lot of intentionality. Okay. Um, you know, occasionally you'll get the, you know, why is this so hard? Why can't we just do blah? <laughs> And I go, yeah. you know, and so like everything about how I talk about this stuff, it's like building from first principles, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, you just starting off with like, okay, let's figure out what is agile, right? What does it mean to, to operate with agility? What are the attributes of an organization? You know, okay, so let's look at your organization. How far are off are you from that? Right. I mean, it's just, it's really kind of fascinating and sometimes it's nuanced and, and, you know, the people that hire us are the people that get that, that message. And, um, and it's good, right? I cool. mean, uh, I tell people all the time, we're not everything to everybody, right? We have a specific problem in a, that we solve and a specific approach to solving it. And, you know, a big part of my job is, is to finding those clients that want to go on this journey with us and solve the problem this way. So, yeah, cool. All right, man. Thank you very much for doing this. You got it, man. Anytime. And happy new happy year. To do it. Happy new year to you too, Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>